It is good to see you as we've gathered together in the house of the Lord in our nation. We celebrate Memorial Day weekend. And in the church today, we celebrate Trinity Sunday, which is uh, one of the only Sundays, in fact, the only Sunday on the church counter, calendar that we develop to a specific doctrine, this mystery that somehow one God is revealed to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we've come to worship God and to rejoice in His presence among us. Uh, we are glad that you are here this morning. We welcome you to Bridgeport United Methodist Church. We are a Matthew 25 church, a community of faith that is in ministry with and for the least, the last, the lonely, and the left out. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25 that when you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto me. And so we've gathered this morning to worship, to pray, uh, to hear from God's word, to seek his faith, and then to go forth to share his love in Matthew 25 ministries. If you're able, would you please stand and let's join in our call to worship this morning. Let us raise our voices to worship the Lord in the beauty of God's holiness. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Declare God's glory among the nations, God's wonderful deeds among all people. We have come to exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. We rejoice and praise God's holy name. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. Hallelujah. Let us pray. O God of majesty and power, how awesome you are to us. The mountains tremble, and the seas roar at the sound of your name. And yet, you have chosen to make yourself known to us. You've chosen to come to us in love and in tenderness. On this Trinity Sunday, we pray that you would help us to worship you, one God in three persons, and that you would empower us to proclaim and live out our faith in you. You have called us to be your people, your people who act in ways of peace and justice in your world. And so God... We pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word, and having heard, to go forth to act in ministries of hope and peace for all your earth. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, true and living, forever and ever. Amen. Now let us pray with the confidence of the beloved children of God, just as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of celebration together. Number 61, the United Methodist hymnal, Come Thou Almighty King.
Amen. You may be seated. We have many opportunities here at uh, Bridgeport United Methodist Church to be involved in worship, service, and fellowship, and invite you to take a look at the bulletin to keep up to date with all of the things that are happening. Just highlight a couple things for you this morning. Uh, first of all, the Rummage Cell Collection continues through May 29th, so this is your final week. If you have some things in your house that you would like to uh, get rid of and, and maybe pass on uh, to someone else that they might find to be a treasure, uh, we invite you to do that through the 29th. And then um, we will need your help on June 1st at 8.30, beginning at 8.30 in the morning. So men, women, who, boys, girls, whoever can help uh, to set up uh, as we begin to set up for the rummage so with all of the uh, clothing racks and tables. So your help would be appreciated uh, on June 1st. Also, uh, we'll point out that the United Women in Faith are having a summer kickoff celebration uh, next Sunday at 3 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, all women are invited for that time of fellowship, so we invite you to join them for that. Uh, note in the bulletin that our Vacation Bible School registration form is available, uh, so encourage you to register your children, your grandchildren, and let your uh, friends and neighbors know about our Vacation Bible School that will be coming up in July, July 21 through 23rd, uh, and take advantage of, of that registration opportunity there. Uh, and more details will be coming in the uh, month ahead as we continue to work together uh, to give this time uh, of learning and fellowship for our children. We do need some help and assistance with our Clarksburg Mission dinners uh, in the month of June and several of the months following. So if you can help with the Clarksburg Mission dinner, uh, the information is on the bulletin board out there. You can give uh, either through a monetary gift and we can then arrange for uh, that dinner to be served. You can prepare it and drop it off or you can prepare it and go serve it there at the mission. It's a great opportunity if you would like to work with some friends or work with your family to go and serve in that way. We invite you to be part of that uh, and and uh, the list for the sign up there is on the bulletin board on the way out of, at the North X. If you have a prayer concern, you can fill out the blue prayer cards that are there in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, during our final hymn, our prayer stewards will collect those and bring those to the altar. Uh, we will continue to lift those prayer concerns up throughout the week as we uh, pray with those with all of our staff and, and lift those concerns to the Lord. We also thank you for all of the generous ways in which you support the mission and ministry of Bridgeport United Methodist Church. You are a generous congregation, and we are grateful for the way that you support through your tithes and your offerings, the work of the ministry, not only here in Bridgeport, but throughout the world. I want to remind you that there's a variety of ways that you can give. The offering baskets are there on the way in and out of the sanctuary. You can go to our website, bridgeportumc.org. And there uh, is an e-giving tab. You can give a one-time or a recurring gift, or you can uh, send your gift directly to the church office at the address on the front of the bulletin. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving, not only financially, but the ways in which you give through your time, your talents, through your witness, and your service to the world. And as we give back to the Lord, let's stand and offer our doxology today. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> Please remain standing for our scripture today, which comes from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin has blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes, so they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. And then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remains in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Our word of music today is a men's ensemble who shares our song shall rise to
with the seraphs in the book of Isaiah, with the angels in the book of Revelation. We declare this morning, O God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. O God, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence among us as we explore your word together this morning. We pray that as we explore it, that you would speak to our lives, that you would change us, that you would transform us, that you would help us to be the holy people that you're calling us to be. Speak to us, Lord. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. To you we give the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. As a young man, the prophet Isaiah had an experience that would prove pivotal, that would prove foundational to the entire course of his ministry. No one would be able to dispute that he had seen the Lord. And he saw God in such a way that it changed the shape of the rest of his life. Out of this transformational vision that is recorded for us here in Isaiah chapter 6, the glory, the majesty, the holiness, and the righteousness of God would become the ruling concepts of Isaiah's ministry. As the prophet ministered in the nation of Judah for more than 50 years, Isaiah never lost sight of the one true God, the God that he encountered here at the beginning of his ministry. As we experience this vision with the prophet this morning, it presents for us four urgent, four pressing questions. Questions that Isaiah answered back in his time and questions that we must answer today. The first question is, what's going on out there? What's going on out there? What's happening in the world around us? At the beginning of Isaiah's ministry, what's going on out there is that King Uzziah died. It was in all the newspapers, and it was on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC. It was in all the public places and all the conversations. They all were abuzz with the news that the king was dead because the death of a king meant a time of national endings. It meant a time of transition. It meant a period of uncertainty and a time of instability. Most of us don't know a whole lot about King Uzziah, I would guess, but he ruled longer than any other king in Judah's history. He ruled longer than David, longer than Solomon, longer than all of them. And he was an able administrator and a, a good leader. According to Second Chronicles, under his leadership, Judah had grown in every way. And so for 52 years, Uzziah had ruled. For 52 years... There had been stability. For 52 years, there had been some semblance of certainty. But now the king has died, leaving instability and uncertainty in its wake. And coupled with that death came the recognition that Judah's enemies were pushing nearer and nearer to this country. And thus, as a young man, Isaiah faced a generation of political uncertainty, of economic upheaval, of international danger, and of internal peril. What's going on out there? Well, if we were to reply to that question, our answers wouldn't be all that different from Isaiah's. We face political upheaval and polarization. We face an epidemic of violence. We, place so many, we face so many complex and difficult questions. Tensions persist in nations throughout the world, including the Middle East and the Ukraine. What's going on out there? It's a time of unpredictability. It's a time of uncertainty. But ironically, it's in those times, in the times of crisis, that God often makes Himself known to us. And so the question, what's going on out there, leads to the second inquiry. What's going on up there? What's going on up there? The prophet declares, I 
saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Notice, Isaiah only gives a short moment, a short statement of what's going on out there. Just the short phrase, in the year King Uzziah died. But then his attention is quickly diverted to a heavenly scene. Like Isaiah, we will not survive if we simply look at what is going on around us in the world. We won't survive if we just look at what's going on around us in our lives, even in the church. No, our hope does not come by looking out. Our hope comes by looking up. I saw the Lord, Isaiah says. And where did he see the Lord? He was seated on a throne. You see, the human throne, the throne of King Uzziah, was vacant. But that didn't mean that the real throne was empty. Because the Lord God Almighty was seated on His throne. And despite the circumstances going on around Him, Isaiah saw that the Lord God Almighty reigns. That the Lord God Almighty is clothed with majesty and with power. And that the Lord God Almighty was still on the throne. God was still on the throne even at that moment in the year of King Uzziah's death. God was ruling just as God has always ruled. What's going on up there? What's going on up there? Well, in the prophet's vision, the Lord occupies and dominates the heavenly throne room. And Isaiah observes these seraphim, these odd, weird, mysterious winged servants of the Lord, these angelic beings that devote themselves fully to the one who sits on the throne. And the primary activity that, thrill, that fills that room is unending praise. It's a hymn of, of praise that is sung by the divine choir. It sings of the holiness, the splendor, the glory, and the majesty of the ruler of heaven, the true king, God Almighty. And his governance extends not only in heaven, but throughout all the earth. That's why the song of the seraphim begins in holiness and it ends in glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Yes, He's the Holy One. No one else can be compared to Him. But at the same time, His presence, His glory, the glory of this Holy One fills the entire earth. His presence is not restricted to heaven, but His presence flows throughout the earth. And the entire message that the prophet Isaiah receives is that God is in control. That God is still ruling and reigning over heaven and earth. But sometimes it's easier to say that than it is to believe it, isn't it? We look around in the situations in the world. We look around in the situations in our lives. And we say, can God really be in control? Is it really possible that God is ruling and reigning? It sounds good, but is it really true? Maybe you're in a situation in life where those words, God is in control, don't seem to be true at all. Can it really be that God is in control? You know, often our lives are like looking at the backside of a watch. I used to always wear a watch, and I don't know what happened. But, Melissa, you need to buy me a watch. But, yeah, I know. It, I, uh, thank you. She bought me three. It's true. Okay. They all die. They all die. You look, at the, uh, you look at the inside of that watch on the backside, right? And you have all these gears and these wheels going that way and that way. And it looks like there's no sense being made at all. It's kind of just chaotic. But then you turn it over and you see that there's rhyme and there's symmetry. The thing actually tells time, right? The back part moves the front part and it begins to make sense. We spend much of our life looking at the backside of things. And it's not until that day when we shall see God face to face, just like Isaiah did, that we will understand it all. But in the meantime, as we wait for that day, we are called to maintain faith in the God who somehow, even when it doesn't seem like it, is in control. And like Isaiah, we can be reminded that God is on the throne and that God rules and reigns as we gather in worship each week, as we worship God in our personal devotional times, because it is in worship. It is in worship as we take time to recognize God's holiness and God's majesty and God's glory that God comes to us amidst the chaos and the turmoil and reminds us that God's got this. He's got this. So what's going on up there? Isaiah saw the Lord. That brings us to the third question. Isaiah's vision of the Lord calls him to, uh, causes him to ask, what's happening in me? What's happening in me? So he's aware of the desperate situation and the need in the world. He's been made aware of God's awesome holiness 
And now Isaiah is suddenly aware of himself. And the overwhelming sense of God's holiness brings the prophet to see himself in a new light. And specifically what the prophet sees is that he's unworthy, that he is inadequate, that he doesn't have the ability to really be in God's presence, that he shouldn't be there in the presence of this holy God. Note the terms that speak of, of that state. He says, woe, woe is me, I'm lost, I'm unclean. These terms, woe, lost, unclean, indicate that Isaiah finds himself in dire straits. As John Calvin said, he's reduced to nothing. You know, it's when we see God clearly that we can begin to see ourselves clearly. And when we really see God, we realize that He is the Holy One. And we begin to examine ourselves and realize that we have a lot of things in our life that aren't really up to par. And we especially open our eyes to those little things like greed and envy and anger, like unforgiveness and bitterness and self-pity. When we see God, we focus away from the faults in others. We quit trying to judge everyone else and we come to terms with the faults in ourselves. And we say, it's me, it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of prayer. When Isaiah recognizes his sinful state, it's interesting. He doesn't plead for mercy. He doesn't make great vows to God. Oh God, if you'll deliver me, I'll do this or that. All the evidence makes it appear that Isaiah believes that his case is hopeless. But yet, out of the smoke comes a seraph. I've been trying to say a serpent all day, but a seraph. Out of the smoke comes a seraph with a purifying coal. You see, God does not reveal himself in order to destroy us. God reveals himself in order to redeem us. And God comes through this seraphim. And that seraph puts, puts that coal on Isaiah's lips and the effect is complete cleansing as Isaiah's guilt departs and his sin is blotted out. You see, through his son Jesus Christ, God has made a provision for sin and iniquity whereby their effect is mitigated and their power is broken. And so the prophet can legitimately stand in the very presence of God just as we can today. But if we are to stand in God's presence, we, like Isaiah, have to recognize our sinfulness and we have to confess it as we encounter our Holy Lord. We have to recognize that we try to do this on our own. We try to be self-sufficient. But when we confess that sin and that self-sufficiency, God stands ready to cleanse us. God stands ready to consume our unrighteousness with His holy fire. And so will you allow that to happen in you today? That brings us to the fourth question. The fourth question is, what's going to happen through us? What's going to happen through us? What's going to happen through us when we become aware of what's happening around us, when we recognize who God is, and when we realize the need in our own lives? Well, in verse 8, God speaks for the first time. And God's words in this passage make it plain that spiritual experience is never merely a means to an end, nor an end, itself, end in itself. It's not just that, oh, I'm forgiven of my sin, isn't it great? And we just go on living like everything's dandy. No, we're forgiven of our sin, and then God gives us a part to play in his kingdom. You see, the throne room of heaven has business to conduct, and he needs people to help him conduct it. He needs messengers, and the Lord needs carriers. That's why he says, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And immediately... Apparently, without reflection upon the cost, Isaiah promptly responds, Here I am. Send me. I'll go. But here's the point. God's work in our lives does not stop with God cleansing us from sin. After God takes away our guilt, God has a mission. God has a task for us because God is going to work through us. Now, most sermons are on Isaiah 6. Every sermon I've heard on Isaiah 6 always ends with verse 8. After God says, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, Here I am. Send me. And it probably ends with verse 8 because the rest of this chapter is really disturbing. <laughs> it's really, really disturbing. In these final verses, the Lord gives Isaiah the content of the message to, that he's to proclaim. And this has to be among the most rotten calls to ministry that anyone could receive. To put it in modern terms, God says, Isaiah, I want you to be a pastor. And Isaiah says, great, God, I want to be a pastor. What, what do you have in store for me out there? 
And, I, and God says, well, you know, Isaiah, you're going to go out and you're going to preach. And when you preach, you will be eloquent and you will preach with power. But people will fall to sleep. Uh, fall, fall to sleep. Uh, go to sleep. That's what I'm saying. Fall asleep while you preach. They're going to go to sleep like some of you. <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to see, you know, heads thudding on the pews in front of you. And when they, after they're done falling asleep, they're going to be again disappearing, and they're not going to come back. You're not going to be a pastor of a church that grows. In fact, when all is said and done, Isaiah, you're going to have the most, at the most 10% left of the congregation with what you start. Well, that's my call for your life, Isaiah. Go preach to those stubborn people. Let your preaching confirm their hardness of heart. That's your mission. No great revivals, no great waves of the Holy Spirit. Just go preach and see everyone fall away. And if that had been me, I'd been like, okay, God, why don't you find somebody else? Isaiah goes, and he shares that message. This was Isaiah's commission, as it is for all servants of God, not to be successful in human terms, but to be faithful. Our call is to be faithful. Our call is to do what God has called us to do. And all of us, all of us have a call of some kind. That's one of the great things that the reformers the, of the Protestant Reformation discovered in Scripture, that all of us are called to ministry. And your calling, it might not seem glamorous. It might not lead to fame. You might not be the most wise or powerful person, but God wants to use you wherever you are. Because from God's point of view, there are no little calls because there are no little people and there are no little places. There's a poem that says, Master, where shall I work today? My love flowed warm and free. He pointed out a tiny plot and said, Tend that for me. But I answered quickly, Oh, no, not there. No one could see, no matter how well my task was done. Not that little spot for me. But his voice, when he spoke, was not stern but kind. He answered me tenderly, Friend, search that heart of thine. Are you working for them or for me? Nazareth was just a little place. And so was Galilee. What is going to happen through us? We must ask, God, what will you have me to do? And then do it, because God is calling each and every one of us to his service. So this morning, let us ask these four questions. What's going on out there? What's going on up there? What's happening in me? And what's going to happen through me? These questions will lead us to a new vision of our world, to a new vision of our God, to a new vision of ourselves, and to a new vision of our mission. And none of these questions can be overlooked because each element leads to the next. The king's death prepares the way for the vision of God. The vision of God leads to Isaiah's self-examination. His self-examination opens the door to cleansing, and cleansing makes it possible to recognize his part in God's mission, his service to the kingdom. All of his experience leads Isaiah to offer himself. Today, God is still in the transformation business. God is still transforming lives, just like he did back in Isaiah's time. Will you allow God to transform us? Can we be transformed from people who are self-sufficient, people who think we got it all under control, into the holy people of God who do God's work in our world? Well, how can this happen? It can happen as the experience of Isaiah becomes our experience. It can happen when we begin to see ourselves against the backdrop of God's holiness and glory, when we receive anew God's gracious provision for sin, and then we are empowered by God to go forth and to share his love in this hungry world. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we thank you for the good news, even here in the Old Testament and the prophet Isaiah. And we thank you that Isaiah draws our attention to those things that are happening around us. And like Isaiah, we see a lot of chaos and turmoil in our world. And we wonder, why is this happening? But we're also reminded that you are still on the throne. And I pray today that you would give us a new vision of your glory, a new vision of your holiness, a new vision of your majesty, so that we may recognize that you truly are the God who is in control of heaven and earth and that you are still on the throne. God, help us to experience as we examine our own lives and confess our sin, to know that you have cleansing for us, to experience your forgiveness, 
But Lord, we thank you that your forgiveness is not the end of the story, but that you transform us into people who play a part in your kingdom. Help us, God, to be faithful, faithful to carry out whatever it is, whatever task you have for us. Open our eyes to that mission and help each and every one of us to devote ourselves to the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response today is number 593 in the United Methodist Hymnal. And as we stand and sing it, I invite you to come to the altars this morning to respond to the Lord, to encounter him anew. He's here today. Won't you come as we sing, Here I Am, Lord.
Amen. 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 Let us boldly declare our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed today. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to the Lord in prayer this morning, please feel free to lift up uh, any joys or concerns that you might have as opportunity is given today. Let us pray. Oh God, God Almighty who reigns in holiness and majesty, we worship you this day. Our lives are filled with your praise and your glory. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Most especially, we give thanks for the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and for the means of grace that allow us to encounter you, O oh God. Thank you that you are at work in our lives and in our world. We give you thanks for that. We have so much to celebrate, so many joys that are around us. As we look at this season of spring, we thank you, Lord, for your love that we see manifest and the changing of the seasons. We thank you for the changes that we see as we celebrate milestones in our lives. And we remember graduates especially. We pray that you will be with them as they make this transition into the next phase of their lives. We rejoice with them and at the same time we pray that you will give them guidance and direction. Lord, we thank you for all of those who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and other milestones in their lives. Will you work in us, Lord, so that we might continue to give you praise and glory throughout all our years. If you have any joys that you would like to share this morning, please share those at this time. We rejoice at anniversaries, including for George and Cheryl today. God, we are thankful that you are near to those who need your healing presence, to those who are sick, to those who are facing situations where there needs to be a mending in their lives and a mending in relationships, wherever your healing is needed. We pray that you would work in the midst of these situations. We especially lift up to you those who are in the hospital and pray, Lord, for your strength to be with them. For those who are recovering from surgeries or might be facing surgeries in this coming week, would you work in their lives, lead and guide the doctors and those who are responsible for their care? We pray for those with ongoing and chronic conditions and those that are homebound in our church family. We ask that you, God, would surround them with love. For those in nursing care facilities, Lord, we pray for your presence. If you have the names of individuals that need God's healing today, would you lift those names at this time? God, we thank you that you are near to the brokenhearted. And we pray for those families, Lord, who have lost loved ones, that you would speak to them in the midst of their grief and let them know that you are there with them as they go through the valley of the shadow of death. We thank you for your presence in all situations and for the hope of eternal life. But Lord, we also recognize how deeply our hearts can be wounded at the loss of loved ones. If you have families or individuals that need God's comfort in the midst of grief, Please lift those names. Lord, we pray for the Robinson family and for the Persinger family, Lord, as well, yes.
God, we pray that on this Memorial Day weekend, as we as a nation remember those who have given their lives in service to their country, that we would remember those who mourn those losses and who feel those losses very deeply, that you would bring comfort to family members who continue, Lord, to grieve those losses. And as we remember and honor their sacrifices, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to honor those sacrifices by, first of all, committing to the work of your kingdom and pledging allegiance first to that kingdom, and then of serving in ways that you might call us to serve, and especially in ways that might work for peace, so that we might bring an end to warfare and an end to the loss of life. Lord, we pray for the leaders of our nation, that you would help them, Lord. You would give them wisdom and guidance, especially as they deal with difficult situations and conflicts throughout our world. We pray for the Ukraine and for Israel, for the Palestine situation, that you there in the midst of that would somehow bring peace. And we pray that you would hasten the efforts of those who work for peace. We thank you for your love that is continuing to go forth, even amidst those hostilities. God, be at work, we pray. Be with our leaders at every level of government, including our state and local leaders, O oh God. Give them the discernment that they need. God, we pray today for the church of Jesus Christ, that you would give us as a church, a church here in Bridgeport uh, and the church universal, you would give us a new vision of your holiness and your majesty so that we might be empowered, Lord, to receive your love and your forgiveness and your empowerment to go forth in mission and ministry so that we might serve this world with your love and your grace and share the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of the one God who lives and reigns forever, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in our prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you all thanks and praise, O God. Your powerful voice thundering over the sea spoke creation into being. From your holy throne, surrounded by seraphim, you called your prophets to carry the message of life to those who were enslaved to sin. You sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, and when the enemies of life lifted him up to die, you raised him from the grave and made him the source of life for all who look to him in trust and hope. And now your Holy Spirit bears witness within us that we are indeed your children, born from above of water and spirit, and destined to share with Christ in his sufferings and glory. Holy Lord, the whole earth is full of your glory. We are in awe of your majesty. You invite us to go into the world to proclaim your good news. Help us to go where you lead us every day. And with our hearts lifted high, we will offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here, especially on this holiday weekend. It's wonderful to see you. As we sang, too, of that, uh, as we said, of, of God thundering over the waters, I couldn't help but thinking about 2.30 last night when thunder was shaking the house. Uh, but pray for those who were impacted by some of the water uh, and uh, some damage there today. But uh, we pray God's blessings to be with them as well. Thank you for being our visitor as well, for those that are with us, and we praise and thank you for joining us here on the journey and ask that uh, as we continue uh, that we all can worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together, number 698, God of the Ages.
Today we have heard the good news that even though the world might seem chaotic, God is still on the throne and he is in the transformation business and he has enlisted us in his service. So let's go forth to share his love with the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>